it's uh, it's great to be here in India. I, I always, I always love coming here. The energy here is is awesome. Uh, so, thank you guys all for coming out here today for uh, our first town hall Q and A in in India. I'm I'm so excited to be here. So I think Anki just gave you a sense of, of what we're going to do, but you know these town hall Q and A's are a really important way and, and part of, of how we run uh, the company and the community at Facebook, right? Because for many years, you know, every week inside the company, we've had a Q and A with employees where people can just raise any question they want. Uh, they ask hard questions. They give us feedback and. It's a good opportunity for me to hear from people about what they're thinking about. So we recently started doing this for our community as well, and have been traveling to a lot of places around the world to hear from our community. And you know, India has 130 million people uh, who use Facebook. It's the second biggest country, uh, so it's really important, I think, to have a chance to hear from all of you today and hear what you're thinking about. And you know, we'll probably get some ideas for how we can make Facebook a better service. So. Thank you, guys. I, I really appreciate uh, all of you guys coming out here today to have this dialogue. Now, before we get started, there's, there's one topic that I want to touch on, and that's, you know, as we were flying in to, to Delhi, I received word that there was this terrible earthquake, right, and it centered in Afghanistan, but, you know, also affected people in, in Pakistan and uh, you know, our team who is on the ground here and a lot of my friends uh, here sent me notes saying that we could feel the whole place shake for a minute. Uh, and, you know, it's moments like these when it's so important for people to be able to come together and to know what's going on with the people that you love. Right? We, we often talk about our mission at Facebook as helping people connect, and, you know, a lot of times people think about that as, you know, sharing photos or, you know, simple things that are going on throughout your day. But when there's a disaster, it's, you know, all you want to know is, is, what is, is whether the people that you love are safe. And um, one of the things that I'm really happy about is, you know, we activated the safety check tool that we have for the community on Facebook. And already, uh, more than 3 million people have marked themselves as safe, and more than 150 million people uh, in the community have been notified that their friends and, and loved ones are, are safe, uh, from the impact of the earthquake. So um, I, I really appreciate all the, the effort that, that people have gone to to make sure that, they're, uh, that they tell the, their friends and that their, their loved ones can, can hear that they're safe. And um, this is just another uh, thing that, that you know, our community does that I think is, is pretty important in the world. So I, um, you know, we're, we're continuing to think about everyone who uh, was hurt and had, was affected by this crisis. And uh, we'll be doing more to, to try to help out. All right. We'll get started with some questions. Thanks. Question time. So uh, we receive literally thousands of questions to your postmark. Uh, and there are a bunch of questions which have been selected from that thread. Some of those people are here in person to ask you those questions. The bunch of uh, students who uh, sent in questions when they registered to join the town hall. And we will take some of those questions from there. And then there are some questions which we will uh, take from the live audience. So I know nobody is shy, so please put up your hand, and I'll come to you. So we have our first questioner here, uh, Ankit. Hi, Mark. Hey. Uh, myself, Alkijan, and I'm a chartered accountant by profession. So my question is very simple. And why are you showing so much interest in India? Answer honestly. So our mission is to give everyone in the world the power to share what's important to them and to connect every person in the world. And India is the world's largest democracy. It's you know, one of the, the biggest countries where if you really have a mission of connecting every person in the world, you can't do that without helping to connect everyone in India. So we think about this in two ways. First, there are already... Uh, more than 130 million people in India who use Facebook. It is uh, one of the largest communities that we have across the world, and we take our responsibility to serve uh, the, the people in India who are, who are already using Facebook and WhatsApp, which is also in our family of, of products, 
Um, we take that very seriously. So having the ability to get here and, and talk to people and, and hear what they need from us and what we're, what we're doing well or what we're doing that we can improve and need to do better, uh, that, that's a huge thing that, that we need to do for, for our community. The second part is that there are a billion people in India who do not have access to the internet yet. And if what you care about is connecting everyone in the world, then you can't do that if there are so many people who don't even have access to basic connectivity. Now, you know, everyone here probably has access to the internet in some capacity, and when you've had it for a while, you start to, uh, you know, take it for granted. You know, you, you think about it as it, maybe it's something that I can use to get access to entertainment or, um, or you know, some basic communication tools. But it's easy to forget that if you haven't had access to the internet, um, it's really a tool that provides uh, some vital infrastructure for your life, right? I mean, it can provide educational information for people who don't have access to good schools. Uh, it can provide health information on how to you know, take care of your child or avoid diseases for people who don't have access to good doctors or, or health infrastructure. Uh, it can provide access to job listings uh, for people who live in, in poorer villages where the economy isn't very strong. You know, so the research has, has shown on this that for every 10 people who get access to the Internet, uh, about one person uh, gets a new job, uh, a job is created, and about one person gets lifted out of poverty. So there's just a tremendous opportunity in India, right? If, if there are a billion people who are not connected, then this is one of the biggest opportunities, I think, to uh, help develop the economy here and, uh, and to help um, alleviate poverty and, and, and really lift up a lot of folks. And, you know, it's easy to talk about this as something that will be important for, for India, but I actually think that connecting people in India is one of the most important things that we can do for the whole world, right? Because it's not just uh, improving the lives of, of, of people here um, that getting access to the Internet will have. It's also that, you know, there are all these ideas that, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and students have here that the rest of the world doesn't have access to today because those people don't have the ability to share what they, uh, what they know, right, in their experience. Um, you know, all the things that uh, entrepreneurs and students could produce if they had access to these tools, um, you know, everyone around the world, not just in India, but every other person in the world is, is currently robbed of that opportunity because folks don't have the opportunity that they need here uh, to, to create uh, the companies or, or opportunities that they want. So that's why I care about it. You know, we have... We have a large community of people here. It's the second biggest community that we have in the world, and we care deeply about serving that well and giving everyone the, the best tools that we can to help people share everything that they want. And we really want to get the next billion people online. And, um, and if we can play a role in, in either of those things, then, um, then that's something that I, I personally care a, a lot about. And that's why I'm so excited to be here. Our next question is from you, Ankita. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Welcome to India. Hey, thank you. I, I am Ankita, and I am with the railways, and I am also a sports person. So I, uh, I need to ask you that uh, although we are 130 million users here, how do you wish to connect with those who are not on FB or who don't even have any access to Internet? Yes. Yeah, this is the key question. All right, so, so if I just talked a bit about why I thought connecting everyone to the Internet was important. I, I think, um, you know, what, what you're asking about is kind of how you do this, right? How do you get uh, a billion people uh, onto the Internet and, and to improve their lives in that way? And, you know, the first thing that I'd say is just we can look at the efforts that we've had with Internet.org and our other programs um, around the world and here in India. You know, Internet.org is we've... We've had this program to spread internet connectivity. It is live in uh, more than 24 countries, or 24 countries and, and growing around the world. Um, and here's a new stat that we haven't shared before, is there are 15 million people around the world who have access to the internet now because of the efforts that we're taking with internet.org um, who, who wouldn't have had it otherwise. And, you know, if, if you believe these, these stats uh, that, that we've seen, that show that for every, you know, 10 people who get access to the Internet, there's, you know, a new job is created and a uh, person is lifted out of poverty, then, you know, connecting 15 million people to the Internet around the world is, 
you know, that's a pretty good impact. You know, so for, I, I've seen some cynical reporting saying that, oh, this is, the program isn't doing as well as we want. I don't know. If you don't think that's good, I, I, I want to know what you think is good. Um, but, you know, this is, it's, we're off to a good start around the world. Um, what we found is here in India, uh, almost a million people are now have access to the Internet because of, of these efforts who, who didn't uh, before. What we find is that in the places that have access to these free basic services, um, the rate of people getting on the Internet doubles. Right? So you know, we, we've started it in, in some areas, and, and it hasn't expanded throughout the whole country yet. So in the areas that, that have it, uh, Internet growth rate is, is twice as much as it, um, as it was before. So that's the, the main message that I deliver, is, you know, this is a program that is working around the world. We just started in India a bit earlier this year, so it's still a bit earlier in its growth, but uh, we know that this works, and we know that it will connect more people. In terms of how exactly it works, uh, there are, you kind of need to break down, there are about 4 billion people in the world who don't have access to the Internet. And they kind of break down into three there are three reasons why people might not have access. Um, one is we call availability, right? It's, you might have a phone, but there's no network that's available for you to access. Uh, the second is affordability, right? Which is you have a phone and you might be able to access uh, a network, but it's very expensive or you might not be able to afford it. And the third issue, which is actually the biggest, interestingly, is awareness. And what that means is, you know, you have... Uh, a phone, and you have access to the, and, and you can get access to the internet, and you can afford it, uh, but you um, may not know why you would want to use the internet. And you know, if you grew up and you never had access to a computer, and you never used the internet, and someone asked you if you wanted to buy a data plan, um, it's not a surprise that a lot of people's question is, well, what do I get with the data plan? Right? Why would I want to spend um, some of the money that I have on, on getting a data plan? So we're doing things on all three of these to to basically break down all of these barriers um, on availability. Uh, there are a lot of places in the world where there just aren't good networks. It's too expensive to have the traditional Internet infrastructure spread all the, way, all the way out to a lot of these very rural areas. So we're investing in new ways to deliver connectivity, uh, solar-powered planes that can fly up in the air and beam down connectivity. Uh, we just announced a project to uh, put a satellite up in, in space that can beam down connectivity. So those are new ways to deliver connectivity. The second, for affordability, we're very focused on just making it so that our apps and others use less data. Right? So if you go back a, about a couple of years, uh, the Facebook app now uses, I think it's about uh, one-tenth of the amount of data as it used to. So that means that not only does it cost you one-tenth as much because you don't have to pay for that data, but it's also faster and more reliable because you know, there's less to, to transfer over the wire. So that's a big deal. And then the third issue of awareness, uh, what we've done is we've tried to introduce this, this program, Free Basics. And what that does is it makes it so that people can have access to, uh, you know, some not, not the richest kind of media, not streaming videos or, um, you know, big app downloads, the stuff that kind of consumes a lot of bandwidth, but the basic utilities. So stuff like education information or health information or uh, job listings or Wikipedia or basic communication tools or basic news. And what we found is that that ends up being very useful. People use those things, they get on the internet, and then within uh, about a month, about half of the people who have tried out free basics now realize why the internet is so great and why they want to use it, and then they become full paying customers of the full internet. So the goal of free basics is not just to provide uh, free basic services to everyone, but it's also to give people this uh, on-ramp so that way they can uh, start experiencing that, and then eventually, uh, and, and relatively quickly, start paying for the overall internet. So that's the game plan. We're going to work on all three, availability, affordability, and awareness. Um, it's already working around the world. 15 million people now uh, have access to the internet who wouldn't have otherwise. And we're still early, so it's growing, and we expect a lot more to, to come soon. So this is a question which lots and lots of people want answers to. It's the top, one of the top voted questions on the thread. And I think it's a serious one, R deserving a serious right. answer. Right. And this is, I seriously don't want to get any more invitations on Candy Crush. How can I stop getting it? There you go. All right. See, so this is where 
these town hall Q&As are really useful. <laughs> because I actually saw this question that it was the top voted question on my thread. So I sent a message to the person who runs the team in charge of our developer platform. And, and, I, and I said, you know, by the time that I do this town hall Q&A, I, I, I think it would be good if we had a solution to this problem. <laughs> so we do. Um, so she emailed me uh, like later that night and was like, all right, look, there, there are some tools uh, that are kind of outdated that allow people to send invitations to people who have never used a game and have gotten a lot of invitations in the past, uh, but you know, don't play games on Facebook. And you know, we hadn't prioritized um, shutting that down because we just had other priorities, but if this is the top thing that people care about, then we'll prioritize that and we'll do it. So we're doing it. Okay, audience question, who wants to ask a question? Okay, I, I'll come there uh, in a bit. Uh, what's your name? Uh, my name is Shashwat. Yeah. Hi, Mark, I am Shashwat, Hi. and I lead the technology team at Holidify.com. So my question was related to the technology that you guys are working on, the Oculus Rift. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know that how guys you have decided to, are you guys planning to incorporate that somehow to the social media and the second part of my question is, how can, as a developer, we'll be able to get more, uh, more of that information, and how can we use that technology into our stuff, and our, we can work on that? Absolutely. So for your second question first, we have dev kits for Oculus. Uh, you can already get them. Um, it's, it's a few hundred dollars, and we're shipping them all around the world. We've shipped more than, uh, I think it's more than 100,000 or uh, almost 200,000 dev kits. So uh, you can get your hands on one. You can start building for Oculus. Um, it's, an, it's an awesome experience, and, and I encourage you to do that if you're interested. In terms of how this fits into the overall vision, you know, one of the big trends that we've seen uh, on, on Facebook and, and on the Internet overall is that as time goes on, people get these richer and richer mediums for sharing what's important to them. So if you go back you know, 10 or 15 years, most of what we shared on the Internet was, um, was text, right? And you know, over the last five or 10 years, now a lot of it is photos. And it's, it's visual uh, and you know, so photos, other kind of graphical content. Um, over the next period of time, we're really, I think, entering this golden age of internet video, where the primary way that we're going to both share our experience and consume uh, other people's kind of experience and ideas online is going to be through video. So you've seen this progression from text to photos that were graphic but static to videos that are now kind of animated and richer. But, you know, I don't think videos are the end of the line, right? Because as rich as a video is in terms of telling a story, it's, um, you know, it's still uh, just, um, you know, small screen. It's still 2D. And, um, you know, I think that, that people want uh, a, an even richer medium, right? You, you want to be able to feel like you're there. And that's what virtual reality and, and augmented reality can do. Uh, they can make it so that you, you actually feel like you're um, right there in the scene. So, you know, my wife and I are, are expecting a, a, a daughter um, sometime soon. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I look really forward to doing is, um, you know, traditionally people, you know, write to their... Uh, thank you, by the way. I'm, I'm very excited about that as well. Um, <laughs> You know, people will, you know, write to their parents, oh, you know, our, our baby had her first step. So, or, you know, you take a photo, or more recently, you take a video. I, I mean, I want my family to be able to be there, right? I mean, so to take a, a um, like a, a video or capture that experience of, of her taking her first steps, and then to be able to share that experience and make it so that my, my parents, um, my friends who weren't maybe able to be there in person um, can feel like they're there and experiencing that and, um, and, and seeing her do that and, and take those steps. And um, that, I think, is going to be really magical. So in terms of how this fits into the overall vision of social media, you know, just as time goes on, the, the, um, the trend is towards richer and richer communication. And I think at some point in the, in the future, it's going to take, you know, maybe five or ten years to really develop before this is a, a, a very big thing that a lot of people are doing. Um, I think that this is going to be something where you can capture these scenes and you can share them in your feed or on WhatsApp, uh, just like you share a photo or text today, and you'll be able to pass around these things which are going to be very close to real-life experiences that we have. And I think that's going to be pretty amazing. I I'm really excited about that. 
So we have the first student question here. Rachit, what's your question? Hey, Mark. Uh, thank you for coming to IIT Delhi. It's a great honor for us. And my name is Rachit. I'm a student here. So Facebook and me is investing a lot in AI with the opening of Facebook AI Research Lab in Paris and other university collaborations. So what are the, some, some of the future products we can expect from Facebook in this regard? Yeah, so AI is a really exciting area of development. I, you know, I think about it, we have this goal that in five to 10 years, we want to be able to build uh, computer systems which can be better at the main human senses than people are, right? So can, can see better, right? Can, can kind of recognize people or, or things in the world, um, can kind of track as, as um, you know, we travel through the world, uh, can hear better, can translate language uh, better, can, um, can understand language, right? All, all these things which are kind of basic human senses. Um, now, it's important to differentiate that. That does not mean that we're going to have computers that are smarter than people anytime soon. Um, you know, for a long time, we've been able to build computers that can do specific tasks uh, better than people, but I still think we're, we're very, very far off from having computers which are generally um, more intelligent in, in any way. So th this is one step on, on kind of the, the path to delivering great services. And, you know, the type of stuff that we're going to see is... Um, you know, it's less that it's going to be completely new products, and it's more going to be that there's this increasing intelligence through a lot of the different things that we do. So let me give you two examples. So one is, uh, this is something that we actually just launched in the last week or two, is, you know, we take accessibility features on Facebook very seriously, right? So for people who are blind or uh, can't see the service, we want to make sure that they can experience the moments that their friends are sharing with them. So one of the things that we can do now is if you're blind and you can't see a photo, uh, we can have our AI look at the photo and figure out what's in it and then read an explanation of what is in the photo to you. So here's the person who's in the photo, they're riding a bike, here's the scene, here's what's going on. It's not 100%, it'll, it'll improve and it'll keep on getting better in the future, but I mean, I think that that's a really cool thing that you can do when you have computers that can see the world in, in the way that, that people do. And th that's the type of thing that I'm really excited about. Um, a second example. Uh, so I talked about safety check earlier, um, connected to the the earthquake uh, here, and you know right now the best way for people to know that their friends and, and loved ones are safe are to either have you know you, yourself mark yourself as safe, or uh, for you to mark your friend as safe, and then for us to distribute that out to the people who are going to care, right? So your friends and family. In the future, I, I think that it's going to be possible you know, with satellites and things like that to be able to identify who is in an area um, and know um, um, immediately who is safe, who needs help. Uh, you know, today a lot of what we do uh, is, you know, for people who are going in for relief efforts, they, they look at maps and they, they see where the areas that are affected are. But, I mean, is that the kind of thing that a computer could do better than a person in the future? Probably, right? And that'll save people's lives. And that, that's the type of stuff that, that I think um, making it that computers can see better and can, can hear better, are just going to unlock all this value for, for the world and are going to save lives, are going to make um, a lot of content more accessible and just improve a lot of the things that we do already uh, to, to a, a large degree. So that, that's what I'm really excited about there. We have a question here from you, Mohit. Hi, Mark. Welcome to India. Uh, Thanks. My, my name is Mohit uh, from Delhi. I'm working as a software testing engineer. My question is how Facebook uh, help uh, those people who are living in the below poverty line and role of Facebook in uneducated people? Oh, sorry, I didn't catch the last part. Ro how can you help illiterate people who are sort of grappling with education, formal education yeah. challenges? Yeah. So this is a really interesting area. Um, you know, Facebook, our mission is giving people the power to share and making the world more, more open and, and connected. But, you know, I, I also spend some time thinking about what the impact is that, uh, that, that I can have outside of Facebook as well. And I've actually, I've focused a lot of my time on, um, on learning about the education system, um, both in the U.S. and, 
and increasingly worldwide as well. And we've done a few big projects, um, starting off in, in a city in, uh, called Newark, New Jersey. And, you know, we started that about five years ago. And one of the things that I'm, that I'm proud of is that already in, in just the few years since we got started, the graduation rate in that city has increased, I think it's from 56% to now 69%. So there's still a lot of room for improvement, but I mean, 13%, yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited about that too. 13% um, in just a few years uh, of work, where that means that whatever improvements w w were, were made in the schools, all the students who were going through that haven't really even gone through the whole system with those improvements already up 13%. I mean, that's a big deal. Um, so that was kind of the first set of things that we did. Um, and then after that, we we took on other initiatives, in, including um, working in our home in, in, in the Bay Area in California uh, to take what we learned from that experience in Newark and um, double down on the things that, that worked well, creating new school models, um, funding the parts that worked really well in the public schools there. And um, that one is newer, so that's only you know, a year, uh, two years old, but we're already really excited about the results that we're starting to see there um, as well. Internationally, um, we, we have a few investments in creating new types of schools um, throughout Africa and, um, and hoping to spread that to, to India um, sometime soon as well. But, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people in the world who don't have access to, uh, to good educational tools. And this is one area where I think not only being able to spread uh, access to good schools, but this is an area where connectivity and access to the internet is really going to be able to help out a lot as well. Because, you know, for all the people who don't have access to a good school, uh, being able to have some basic access to educational resources online um, is, is going to make a really big deal in people's lives. So that, that's, that's a pretty big focus for me. Um, the other area that I'm, that I'm increasingly interested in is really health and science. Right? I mean, one of the things that strikes me is, you know, we have all this amazing technology and the world is getting better and better at such a fast rate. Um, and, you know, we've only really, as a civilization, been really focused on curing the diseases that face us for probably about 100 years, maybe a little bit less even. And, you know, one thing that I think is a little bit crazy, you look around the world, um, I mean, in the U.S., there's the stat that the U.S. government spends about 50 times as much money uh, trying to treat people who are sick as it spends trying to cure the diseases in the first place that people don't get sick. And I think that that's pretty similar if you look at the exact stats around the world. I don't know exactly what the, the stats here are in India, but I think that there's a really big opportunity to, uh, to change that, right? And for, for our generation of folks to say, hey, you know, the world is getting better at a very fast rate. And instead of just looking at the status quo around this, we should be shifting more of our resources towards longer-term investments that can actually try to cure all these diseases, right? So that way, you know, I don't know if, if they'll all be cured in our generation or I mean, maybe not even in our kids, but I do think we can make a big dent and maybe, you know, in our kids' lives or, or their kids' lives, we can create a world where uh, people don't have to suffer from the kind of diseases that, that there are today. Um, so those are, are some pretty big things that, that I think we should be trying to take on as a, as a generation around the world. And if we can make a big impact, then that, that'll, that'll be really, really a big deal. Uh, we have a question here, and... Where'd you go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Hi, Mark. This is funny. Uh, I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> it is. My question <laughs> seems to be funny also. <laughs> so my question for you is, if Mark is gifted some supernatural powers from some aliens, what powers would Mark wish for, and how would he use for the betterment of world? a good question. All right, so one of the great things about technology is you actually can build superpowers for people in the world. Uh, and, you know, that's some of the stuff that I think is, is, is really exciting. So when I think about what we're doing with Oculus, for example, I think that what we're really enabling is people to teleport, <laughs> right? Um, you know, it's, you're going to be able to put on a headset 
and go anywhere you want in the world. You'll be able to go to places that are impossible to go to in the world. I mean, one of my, one of my favorite recent demos from Oculus is, um, you know, you put on the headset, and you're in this room with someone uh, else who, who has the headset on somewhere else that can be in a completely different place. And, um, and there's this table in front of you. Of course, it's virtual. And you, there's a ping pong paddle on it. You can pick up the ping pong paddle, and you can start playing ping pong with the other person. And it, it, it just feels pretty awesome. It's like, all right, well, I might be in a completely different location from them, but we can kind of teleport and come together and, um, and have that experience. But that's only the beginning, because then where it really starts to get awesome is uh, you can then, in that experience, you can dial up and down gravity. So you can simulate, you can turn off gravity, and you can simulate what it would be like to play ping pong with a friend in space uh, or underwater. Uh, or you can make it, you know, anti-gravity. So that way, you know, the ball floats away and you have to hit it down in order to make it so that it doesn't go away. So, I mean, that's pretty crazy, right? And in the future, I think, you know, not too far out, we're going to have the ability to just put on a, a basic headset and instantaneously go anywhere in the world that you want. Uh, and that is going to be pretty good. <laughs> We have a question here from Miriam on internet.org and net neutrality. I'll let her ask. Good afternoon, Mark. I'm Miriam George, assistant professor from CMR Institute of Technology, Bangalore. And uh, I'd say that internet.org is actually a great initiative which provides a lot of opportunities. However, there's been a lot of discussion and talks on net neutrality and internet.org. So my question is, does internet.org support net neutrality fully, let's say 100%, without any filtering. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, net neutrality is an important principle, right? And we do a lot to, to support it, both in terms of uh, pushing for regulation uh, that, that kind of enables this, and, um, I, I mean, also just in, in our own work, uh, building an open platform that any developer can, can build something for, uh, regardless of who they are, um, as long as they, they kind of follow the basic rules of what internet.org is. So, um, so let, me, let me kind of explain and go into detail on, on both of these. So in terms of regulation, you know, now I, I think a lot of why there's this net neutrality debate um, here in India and in a lot of places around the world is countries are just kind of going around and figuring out what they want their regulation to be um, for the internet and, and for net neutrality. Uh, the US, I think it was either earlier this year or last year, um, put in place rules that had uh, pretty strong net neutrality regulations that we um, gave our support for and, and suggested that there were kind of very clear rules on, on net neutrality um, that got put into place. And now kind of following that, a lot of other countries are also figuring out exactly what rules they want. Uh, and, and we're generally supportive of, of that across the world as well. Um, in terms of open platform, you know, there have been a lot of stories here in India that suggest that what we're trying to do with internet.org is, you know, just have a set of, a small set of internet services that people can use and kind of somehow make it so that people can't have access to the rest. And that really couldn't be further from the truth. What we're trying to do is, you know, we realize that, you know, the internet is expensive to, to provide, right? I mean, the, the operators, uh, all collectively spend, you know, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars on this infrastructure, and you can't just provide the whole internet for free. But what we have figured out is we can do this free basics program that make it so that, you know, any developer who meets the, the definition of a basic service, so not very high bandwidth, no rich videos or big file downloads, but any developer is doing something that's, you know, basically uh, text, pretty low bandwidth, um, not directly um, cannibalizing uh, a lot of the operator business. Anyone can kind of offer their services for free, and it will be zero rated through uh, the free basics platform that we have. And that, I think, has been very powerful, and it provides this neutral platform where we're not being uh, a filter on any of the content that goes into that. And I think that that's really important and, um, and, and really good. So, you know, net neutrality overall, it's, uh, you know, this, this is an important topic. Right, I mean, it's, it's really important that we have regulations that prevent uh, companies and people from doing things that are going to hurt people. Right, and I think it's really clear if you look at uh, what the regulations are trying to prohibit, 
um, you know, where that hurts people and where it doesn't, right? So, you know, so if you're a, if you're a person and you're trying to, uh, you know, watch some videos on YouTube or, or Netflix and an operator wants to charge you more to do that uh, than something else, then, you know, that's bad. I mean, that, that hurts people. Uh, it prevents your ability to access content. It, it's a violation of net neutrality, and that's the type of thing that we should have regulations that, uh, that, that prohibit. Um, if, if an operator is trying to advantage their, their own service, right, by making you pay more for something else, uh, then, you know, that's the kind of thing you can see why that, that hurts people, uh, and you want net neutrality regulations uh, in place that are going to prevent that. But at the same time, um, it is possible to take this too far, right? And some of the people who are advocating for net neutrality regulations also advocate that, you know, you shouldn't be able to do any kind of zero rating or free services at all. But when I look at this, I see, you know, if you have a student who is getting free access to the Internet to be able to help do her homework and she wouldn't have had access otherwise, who's getting hurt there? Right? I mean, that, that's good. Right? We want that. There should be more of that. Um, you know, if you have, if there's a fisherman in, in a village uh, who now has some free access to the Internet to help sell uh, some of his fish and provide for his family, no one gets hurt by that. Right? And that's good. We, we need to get everyone on the Internet. Um, so, and, you know, the, the good news here is that around the world, uh, all the regulations that are put in place um, are basically honoring this principle, right? So good net neutrality provisions, kind of blocking things that, uh, that, that operators might do that, that kind of hurt people, but also prioritizing things like zero rating that are, are necessary for making sure that we can connect everyone to the Internet. So the U.S. regulations that I mentioned earlier, very clear on this, very strong net neutrality provisions, um, completely separate uh, in terms of how they treat zero rating and not blocking zero rating at all, right? So, and that's a country where most people have access to the Internet. It's not, even, it's not like India where a billion people don't have access to the Internet and even more innovation is necessary to, to expand on that. Uh, I think it's just this week. Uh, the EU just released rules on net neutrality and zero rating where, again, they put in place some net neutrality rules, very clear that zero rating and, and things that provide uh, some free access to, to the Internet are, are kind of clear to go um, and are going to be regulated separately and are not prohibited by any of the net neutrality regulations. So that's my view on this. Um, Internet.org and Facebook 100% support net neutrality. We lobby for it across the world. We build an open platform with no filtering. Um, you guys should count on us to be supportive of that. But at the same time, um, I think we should all make sure that we also continue to push for access because that is extremely important. And, um, you know, I'll leave you with one thought on this, which is that most of the folks who are pushing for, for uh, net neutrality have access to the Internet already, right? So, I mean, I see these, these um, petitions going around, around, around net neutrality, and, and that's great, right? I mean, we need to mobilize on the Internet to push for this stuff. But the people who are not yet on the Internet uh, can't sign an online petition pushing for uh, increased access to the Internet, right? So, so it, yeah, and I think that this is, a, this is a really key point. We all, I think we all have a moral responsibility um, to look out for people who do not have the Internet and make sure that uh, the rules that, that kind of benefit um, us and make sure that, that operators can't do anything that, that hurt us don't get twisted to hurt people who don't have a voice. So... Uh, Mark, you were at Taj yesterday. Somebody posted on your wall, did people recognize you? Do you want to share some of your Taj experience with everybody and whether you're recognized or not? Uh, the Taj was great. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's one of the few places in the world that you see pictures, but then you go, and it's actually even more awesome uh, there than any of the pictures look. Um, there aren't a lot of places like that. And, you know, it's fitting because you travel around the world and there are all these monuments that are built for uh, governments, you know, celebrating military victories or um, religion. And you know, the Taj is unique because it's a monument to love. And, <laughs> and I, I think that that's special. And, I mean, that's, that's a meaningful thing. Um, so I, I really enjoyed it. I'm glad that I got a chance to go. You know, too often... I travel around, I go to different countries, and 
I have so many different meetings and events, so I go to these places that have such rich culture, and I spend my whole time inside conference rooms. And let me tell you, no matter what city you go to in the world, conference rooms look pretty similar. <laughs> but um, so it's, it's, I, I just felt very lucky that I had the opportunity to uh, take a few hours to head, um, head to Agra and, and, and see that. Um, as, as for whether you know, someone uh, recognized me, uh, you know, there's, there's, one, there's one girl I feel bad for who's trying to take a photo of me and wiped out and fell off the sidewalk into a bush. And um, now, fortunately, she didn't get hurt. Um, I, I kind of gave her a pat on the back, and I was like, you know, you've got to be more careful. It's a dangerous business trying to take a photo of me. Uh, but yeah, good times. OK. On that note, we'll take an audience question. I'm going to go to a girl. Uh, Hi, I am Anant, uh, and I am a fourth-year student at IIT Delhi itself. Firstly, we welcome you to IIT Delhi. We, feel, we are really proud as well as lucky to have you here. My, first, like, my question is, what was your Eureka moment when you actually founded Facebook? And like, you are really very young, but there would be many challenges as well. But what's the main driving force which keep you like, not uh, away from the track? Like, and this is my question, and the suggestion regarding the healthcare is like, because now we have, are, all of you, us, we are using the, um, like, yeah, sorry. Yeah, all of us are using the smartphones. So in, there are many apps which can detect, like, blood pressure as well as many other things. So in Facebook itself, we can use some sensors and something like that, which could, like, uh, make us, like, <laughs> All right. It's a pretty good compound question. Um, first of all, I mean, a, a couple of you, um, <laughs> a couple of you have mentioned that you know, that that it's it's great to have me here. I, I feel so honored to be here, and to, um, and and I know that um, that there's uh, even more folks who um, who'd wanted to come here who uh, who who didn't have the chance and. Uh, so next year we'll just need to, to do it in a stadium or something. I, I, I don't know. Um, the um, in, in terms of getting started with Facebook, you know, here, here's the thing. It, you know, it wasn't so so long ago that you know I was a student and you know sitting in, in a seat in an auditorium like uh, you guys are here today, um, listening to. You know, I remember very specifically this time when Bill Gates came to talk at at Harvard and. Um, just like wow, how, how do you how do you do that? Um, and um, but you know the trick is is that the media likes to sensationalize this as if you have some eureka moment or you are some singular person who can build something on your own, and that's just not how the world works. Um, you know, when I was in school, I built a lot of stuff that I just liked building. Um, there was not a single moment when I, when I had some revelation that Facebook was going to be awesome. Uh, that's not maybe how the media or movies or whatever would like to uh, portray things. It's, not, it's much less exciting. But the reality is I think most uh, services in the world that reach the scale that Facebook has, um, you start off building something that you care about and... You know, you don't necessarily think it's going to be that big. I, I didn't. Um, you know, I built Facebook, the first version of Facebook, uh, for my college community because I wanted to be able to connect with the people at my school. And I remember very clearly talking to my friends at the time and saying, you know, it's, how cool is it that we have built this community for our school? You know, one day it's going to be awesome when somebody else builds this for the world because something like this needs to exist for the world. But it didn't even occur to me that you know, my friends and I might be able to play a role in doing that, right? Because we, we were college students, right? I mean, we didn't have any, you know, engineers to, to work with or servers or resources or anything like that. And, you know, there are these huge companies that deliver products for hundreds of millions of people, right? There's, you know, I always assumed that it was going to be like Microsoft or Google or uh, someone would build this for the world. And what basically just happened is um, at each step along the way, we just kind of kept doing the next thing and, uh, growing from there. And 
you know, there, there were teams inside these other companies that, that thought social media was important and were working on it, but you know, there were all these different memes and, and narratives uh, in the world. You know, people would say, oh, well, you know, this is just a fad. People are going to use it, but then they're going to stop. So, um, you know, so a lot of the teams who were working on didn't take it that seriously or, you know, the, the higher-ups in those companies didn't care, so they didn't get resources, and we just kept going and going. And then people would say, all right, well, all right, fine. So maybe people are using it, but it's never going to make any money, right? I mean, social media doesn't make any money. And we, we just kind of kept going and uh, going, and then pretty soon we had a service that was uh, bigger than any of these other ones, and that kind of is how we are here where we are. Um, there's no magic. Um, and, it's, uh, and, and I really think it's like, I mean, you guys are, are at, you know, one of the best uh, technical institutes in the world. You know, one of the things that, that always struck me, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, when I was in school and studying computer science, I always wondered whether it was the real thing, right? Is this like, like all right, I'm, I'm, I'm learning programming, but is this the programming that you really need to be able to build whatever you want in the world? And it turns out the answer to that is absolutely yes, right? The, the stuff that you're, le that you're learning here is absolutely, uh, are absolutely the skills that you need to build anything that you want. And, um, you know, a lot of times I think people just get afraid because, you know, often your dream is, it's, it seems like it's so, um, so far off. But, but if you just kind of focus on building stuff that you think is good and, uh, and, and you keep on going at each step along the way and don't let people deter you from that and you just really care about what you're doing and kind of don't give up at each step along the way, then, um, you know, I think that's how you, uh, that's how you build something good. Okay, we have another student question here. Ayush. Hi, Mark. Uh, I'm Ayush. I'm a uh, uh, second year undergrad uh, in computer science here at IIT Delhi itself. Uh, so my question is, um, like considering the startup buzz everywhere, so uh, everyone uh, comes up with a random app or website uh, idea and considers himself as, a, as the next big thing. So uh, what, what, according to you, is, um, uh, are the elements of, a, of an ideal startup? So there's this big culture that I've seen of people who decide that they want to start a company before they actually know what they're doing. And to me... To me, every good company that I can think of started with someone who cared about something, not someone who started with a decision that they wanted to start a company. And I think that that's both because of who the people are who do that, right? And, you know, and, and, you know building a company is hard, and you, know, you need to kind of keep going through all the, the people who are going to doubt you and all the challenges that are going to come up. So you really do need to care, I think, in order to do that. Um, but at the same time, I think that there's also a practical reason for this, which is that if you decide to start a company and you just start hiring people for whatever your first idea is, then you lose some flexibility, right? It becomes hard to, to pivot or, or uh, adapt your idea. Whereas, you know, if you start working on something because you care about it and you only decide to turn it into a company uh, once it's pretty clear that it can be good, then you actually maintain a lot of flexibility to try out different things that uh, fit your theme of what you care about. And then um, by the time that you actually hit something that's kind of working, you then start hiring, and then those companies have a lot more flexibility and, and therefore, I think, are more likely to work well. But, you know, I mean, most of the great companies that I can think of, they're, they're started by people who really care about what they're doing. They may not have thought that they were going to end up building uh, big companies almost None of the people I know who have built big companies thought that their companies were going to be as big as they actually ended up being, which I think is just a testament to if you kind of care about something and keep going, it can end up just being a lot bigger than you think it's going to in the beginning. But, um, but I would definitely, if you're thinking about starting something, focus on what you want to do in the world and the impact and what you want to change, uh, not the decision to start a company. We have our next student question here. Namaste, Mark. So I'm Roshi Dana from IIT Delhi itself. And uh, my question is that uh, there comes a time in every, every student's life uh, when he or she is completely demotivated. And at that time, soothing words from well-wishers and friends, they seem completely empty. So you must have faced such kind of situation in your life maybe more than once. So if you would like to share an anecdote um, and suggest what should be done during those times. 
So is, so is your question about kind of you're studying for a test and you're, you're bored? <laughs> or, or is it, uh, you know, you're working on something like you're trying to start a company and you have hard it's, it's issues? It's about knowing the social aspect of a person who is a role model for every, you know, person, uh, every student in IIT. I see. Okay. So, <laughs> just that. All right. So, um, yes. It w when it w so, uh, throughout building Facebook, I mean, there have been lots of challenges, and there are all these times where, in anything you do, where you know you're really going to be pushed, and you um, feel like you want to give up or something like that. And you know, this gets back to. I was talking a second ago about how I think the media. There's a little bit of this b cultural bias towards thinking that, you know, one person does this, right? I mean, people say that, you know, I built Facebook or Steve Jobs built Apple or whatever, but, you know, that's really not true, right? I mean, it's, we're, we're people, we, we helped, uh, but there were thousands and thousands of other people involved in building these things, and the reality is, is that as strong as any one individual is, no one person can deal with all the challenges that are going to get thrown at them in, in anything that you do. And, one of the ways that I think we maintain resilience is by having um, co-founders and partners who complement our strengths and uh, fortify our weaknesses and can kind of encourage us and give us a push to, to keep going when things are tough. And there's actually a lot of data on this that suggests that companies that get started with more co-founders are more likely to be successful. And it isn't quite clear um, exactly from that data why that's the case, although it is very clear in terms of the outcome for the startups that it is the case. Um, but I would guess that the reason why that's the case is because of this resilience point, where people who start something by themselves, I, I just think, like, there's no way that any one person can overcome all of the different things that you need to do to, to build a startup or take on any kind of other project in the world. But if you have two or three or four partners, then... I don't know. I mean, maybe over time, one of them doesn't like it and, and drops out, but you still have enough strength on the team to power through all the challenges that you have, and that's kind of how you go. And, you know, at Facebook today, one of the things that I always find a little bit funny is, again, that so much attention is placed on, on me as the person running the company, whereas I think, you know, people like Cheryl, um, who really, you know, is my partner running the whole business, or, you know, folks like Chris Cox, who run a huge amount of our product, or um, Mike Schrepfer, who's our chief technology officer, and, and kind of makes sure that a ton of uh, what we're doing works, or Jay Parikh, who, you know, runs all of our global infrastructure and, and all the data centers around the world. We, we couldn't make Facebook work without those people. Right? And, and there were really hard days where, where I'm not sure what to do next, and, and, and they keep me going. We, uh, we have one more student question here. Hi, Mark. I'm Saranj Goel. I'm a computer science student at IIT. Uh, my question is, what was the decision that you took during the early days of Facebook, which you uh, regretted later? <laughs> one decision? <laughs> um, <laughs> Let me frame this a little differently. So no matter what you do, you're going to make a ton of mistakes, right? And I made it every mistake I think you can probably make. I mean, mistakes in how to set up the company, mistakes in hiring, product mistakes, technical mistakes, um, anything you can, you can kind of think about doing wrong, um, I have probably made that mistake um, in, in trying to kind of build Facebook up, right? I mean, and it, it kind of makes sense. I was a college student when I got started, right? I mean, I didn't know anything about business or hiring. You know, no one is born with these skills, right? So you, you learn them the same way that you learn uh, everything else, right? Trial and error. You, you do it. Uh, you don't be too afraid to make mistakes, and you do <laughs> make mistakes, and you recover, and you keep going. The, the thing that I think is really what you should focus on is not what is the mistake that you should avoid, but instead, if you do something good, you get the strength to power through a lot of mistakes, right? And we're, the reason why Facebook exists today and is serving a community of you know, more than one and a half billion people is not because we didn't make mistakes. It's because we're helping people with something that's very important in their lives, right? Every person wants to stay connected with their friends and family. And if you're doing something that's very important and valuable to people, then 
they'll forgive you if you make some mistakes along the way. And, you know, that's important because we're all human, right? And, you know, no one's perfect. And we've made a lot of mistakes and we will continue because you know, I'm, <laughs> I still have a lot to learn, right, on this journey. Um, there's a lot of new stuff that we're, that we're trying to do and, um, and trying to help uh, improve in the world. So I think that that's what you want to focus on, is, um, is not, not what are the mistakes that you don't want to make, but just do as much good as you can. Okay, we're completely out of time. We'll take one last audience question. All Somebody right. here who's been gesturing and waving for a long time. So I'm just going to give her the mic. Hi, Mark. Welcome to India. I'm Gargi, PhD student. And my question is, can we do something about the missing people? Like we are getting the earthquake notifications that person is safe or not. So can we have some notification for missing people? Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a really good point. We actually, there's a program in the U.S. and Canada, and I think in, that's it for now. Uh, but we're rolling out further. Um, that's called Amber Alerts. And what it basically is, uh, is a program where if children are missing uh, in their area, we will put a story in newsfeed showing that child's face and giving you a way to report to the local police and, uh, and, and other agencies if you've seen that person. And um, it's an incredibly successful program, right? And it's um, in the... I think we, we've launched it less than a year ago. I think it was January of this year we started rolling this out in the U.S. And already, uh, at least one child has been found through the program on Facebook. Uh, I mean, basically, you know, someone saw the, the photo in newsfeed, saw the, the Amber Alert, and then um, realized that one of the kids who was uh, around them was this kid who was missing and reported to the police, and the child was recovered and, and brought home safely. And... Um, you know, we need to work with, with governments and uh, folks in countries all over the world to, to bring this out to more places, but absolutely, I think, is the answer to your question. You know, I think, you know, when you have a community of a billion and a half people, I think you have a responsibility to help people coordinate to do awesome things in the world. And, you know, whether that's coordinating to, uh, for relief efforts, like, uh, for example, our community helped raise, I think it was $17 million for the earthquake relief effort in Nepal, or the community uh, safety check effort that, that we have to make sure that everyone knows each other is safe, or the organ donation work that we do to make it so that people can um, mark that they want to be an organ donor, um, so that way more people can have access to, to, um, to the organ transplants that they need. Um, this is all stuff that I think we want to do, and that's really important, uh, and that I think our community wants to be a part of, and that we're uh, looking forward to doing over the coming years. So thank you. Thank you guys so much.